Good morning. Hello. Welcome to this gathering. Welcome to this circle that is SSUC, Southminster Steinhauer United Church. We are spiritual seekers united in community, and we are gathered here this morning as we gather each and every time as a, as a community of fellow seekers, of travelers, experiencing something human and trying to make it more so. We gather here in this place in Edmonton, we gather online, and if you gather with us by live stream or by way of our videos, uh, welcome wherever you happen to be. We are one community and we're here together for each other and with each other. As we gather in this place, we're reminded that uh, what it means to be community is many things. Uh, it, it means being together uh, and sorting through things, whether they are good, bad, or otherwise. Encountering life's challenges and its joys together. Helping one another walk a path with integrity, with meaning. And as we do that with and for each other in this place and in this community, we are strengthened to do it in other communities in other circles that we find ourselves in. And we find that this is how we impact the world, is by taking community in our small circles and in widening it and broadening it like a pebble in a stream whose circles move forward and move outward. We will take some time now to um, share a few things that are upcoming in the life of the community and uh, want to draw your attention. We are concluding our series that's been inspired by the Oscars over the Sundays in the month of March. And this Sunday we're looking at a movie that did not win any Oscars. Uh, I don't think it was even nominated, but it is an Oscar-worthy film and an important subject that we need to know more about, an important subject in a community of faith such as ours. It's a film about uh, a evangelical community that offer a program often known as conversion or reparative ther therapy. It is a behavior correction program rooted in an understanding of changing one's sexual orientation or gender identity. It's a harmful program that continues to exist in Canada and the United States and other parts of the world. It's a difficult film to watch and it's an important film. And it calls upon all of us to be vigilant, to stand for what is right. So we begin our gathering as we call ourselves into community, singing that commitment to stand for what is right.
We are here in the grace and safety and gift of this place. In a confluence of legacies that shape this land and its peoples, this storied and ancestral land of Cree and Métis peoples who've made their home here for generations. And those who have come to this land in generations past our ancestors, perhaps even ourselves, and Canada's newest comers. We're here, all of us, as partners in the obligations of Treaty 6. And we come, taking our place in the circle, recognizing our responsibility to transcend the wounds of the past, of our history, and seek healing and reconciliation with one another. As we gather each time, we light this candle it is the light of a new day, a new week, a new moment, a new breath. It brings its shadows of grievances and grudges, shades of shaming and blaming. It also comes bearing the light of forgiveness and restoration, bringing possibility, potential. We light this candle as new light, new day, another starting over, letting go, opening up, opening to light and warmth and the opportunity to strengthen our intentions to live well in this light. We sing our intentions with one another. our time for all ages. I want to welcome anyone who wants to come to the carpet to come to the carpet and sit here. You're welcome if you're small or if you're taller. You're welcome whoever you are. Come on. Good morning. Silas, you can come and sit. (laughs) Waiting for mom. Today, today I want to talk uh, to you about someone very special. Uh, If you've spent any time on this carpet, or if you've gone to Kid Spirit, um, 
for probably over the last eight years or so, then you, that's longer than some of you are old, um, then you know a guy named Michael. Um, do you see that guy? Does he look familiar to you? Do you know that guy? That's Michael. Uh, I just want to talk to you about this guy for a minute because I want to tell you a little bit of a story about Michael. Um, Michael loves to read. D does anyone here like to read? You like to read stories? Yeah. Michael likes stories. He loves teaching. That's probably quite clear because he loved being in kid spirit and teaching. He loves science and he loves how to understand how things work. And he loves old movies with a guy named Buster Keaton, who you may never have heard of, but um, that's why he's wearing that hat up in the corner picture up there. He loved that guy and loves that guy. Uh, he loves baseball, particularly a team named the San Francisco Giants, and we know this because every uh, time he comes to church in the spring and summer and fall, he wears a San Francisco Giants jacket. So we can ask him about that. Um, for as long as most of us have known Michael, he has had something strange going on in his brain. And I want to tell you about that because it's, it's very interesting and also it's kind of sad. He's had a tumor growing there. Now, if you don't know what a tumor is, I'm going to tell you. Our whole body is made up of cells. Our whole body is made up of cells. And those cells have jobs to do in our body. But sometimes, cells grow in places they shouldn't grow. And Michael had a, a bunch of cells that, that started growing where they shouldn't be in his brain. And um, for years and years and years, Michael was able to go to work, and to play, and to read, and to go to baseball games, and to travel, and to do all, and to come to church, and to lead kids' spirit with without that problem causing too much of a problem for him. He was able to do all that kind of stuff. But just in the last few months, uh, that started to change, and he couldn't do some of those things anymore. Now that tumor that's in his brain started interfering, started getting in the way of some of the other things that his body needed to do. So it started um, affecting his arm, and his leg, and a couple of other things, so that now he can't move around so good. And he's having trouble moving, and so now Michael is staying in a hospital where doctors and nurses and his family and his friends can care for him. And that means something really sad. It means that Michael can't be our kid spirit leader anymore. And he's really sad about that. And we're sad about that, too. Now, that's a lot of, um, that's a big, long story to tell about Michael. And if you have any questions, you can ask me, or you can ask your parents or your grandparents about something you heard in that story. That... Right, right. It's important that those things in our body work the way they need to. Mm -hmm. So today, today, after I tell you that story, today is our chance to thank Michael for all of the work that he has done in Kid Spirit and here with us in this church. Now, Michael can't be here to hear our thanks this morning, but Michael's family is going to make it so that Michael can watch the video later and see us thanking him for all the time and all the work that he's given to us in Kid Spirit, um, and how grateful we are. So, um, so in a way of thanking Michael, um, we're going to talk, just, I'm just going to say one more thing about his story. When Michael came to this church, he always had energy and excitement to be with you, to be with kids, and to be in Kid Spirit. In summer camps, he would help, in kid spirit, he would help, and he would always share his joy and his positive spirit with everyone. And I would always ask him, because he'd always sign his name to volunteer. 
every month, every week. And I would always ask Michael, Michael, do you want a week off or a month that you can sit here with all of us and, you know, experience something else in the, on Sunday morning instead of always going to Kid Spirit? And do you know what he would say? He'd say, Chris, Kid Spirit is where I love to be. I love it. It's where I want to be, and it's where I can contribute. So sign me up. He would always say that. Sign me up. So, now what we're going to do, because Michael will see this, maybe not right this minute, but Michael will see this maybe later today or tomorrow, and um, we're going to stand up, and even if we knew Michael, if we didn't know Michael when he was in Kid Spirit, that's okay. We're going to stand up here, and we're going to say, thank you, Michael, and we're going to face that camera. So, would you stand with me? Stand up here, and just face that way. Yeah, that way. Just face the back. Do you see where those bright lights are? And if, if you all could stay seated for a minute, you can stand up in a minute. But uh, So um, today, for Michael and with Michael, uh, we're saying thank you today from all of us here at SSUC for the years of leadership, for every week in, week in and week out that you've been here with our children for making our classroom a welcoming and safe place to learn, to explore, to be respected, to be loved. Our hearts are with you, Michael, even though you can't be here this morning. We are with you, our support, our love, our care are with you, and we thank you, Michael, for all your work. Can everyone wave up there at that camera? And everyone, now's your chance to maybe stand, turn, and let's show Michael our appreciation. There's a song that we're going to sing right now before we go to, um, to our, our programs, and it's called We've Got the Strength. And I just want to teach you a, a little bit of it because this is a song that I'd like to sing for Michael and I'd like to sing with Michael because Michael's in the hospital. He needs, he needs some strength. He needs to be brave and courageous. And so we all do. So we're going to sing this for Michael and with Michael today. And uh, I, want to t I want to just uh, tell you the words so that you know them. You can sing the chorus really strong. So I want you to, everyone in the room, to repeat after me. We, we've got the strength. We, we've got the strength. We've got the courage. We've got the courage to face today. Okay, then it's kind of the same. We, we've got the strength. We, we've got the strength. We've got the courage. We've got the courage. Come what may. Come what may. And that means no matter what. Come what may means no matter what happens. We've got the strength. We've got the courage. So that, we're going to sing that a couple of times. And there's another little verse and the words will be up there, but we're going to sing that chorus really strong, okay? Let's sing. We, we've got the strength.
beautiful. Thank you for singing that. We have um, a kid spirit time today in which uh, we're going to have a story. We didn't have a story here, so we're going to have a story there. And we're going to make some very special decorations and cards for Michael that he can have in his room at the hospital. And I know you're all very creative and will make some wonderful, beautiful messages for Michael. So uh, whether... I'm going to share a story with us this morning that I'm pretty sure none of you heard in Sunday school. <laughs> However, honestly, truly, it is actually in the Bible. Oh, good. <laughs> well, it's sort of good, but it's not a very good story. But you're right, it's good it's there. It's a story that comes from the book of Judges. I don't know, maybe you'd call it the country and western section of the Bible. The rough and ready times. This story is set in the collection of stories depicting the time when ancient Israel was governed by warriors. And these warriors governed the land from the time it was taken from the Canaanites until they anointed their first king, Saul. And this book of Judges tells a series of colorful battle stories that highlight their tribal leaders. And as you'll notice, the storyteller interprets the victories and the defeats in their battles as the work, the judgment of their tribal god. This comes from Judges chapter 11. It's a text of terror. Jephthah made a vow to his God, and he said, if you'll give the Ammonites into my hand, if you'll give them, me victory over them, whoever comes out of the doors to meet me when I return victorious from battle, I will offer up to you as a sacrifice. After inflicting defeat on his enemy, Jephthah came home, and there was his daughter to meet him with timbrels and with dancing, and she was his only child. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes, and he said, My daughter. You have brought me very low. You've been a cause of great trouble to me. I opened my mouth to my God, and now I can't take my vow back. He delayed acting on that vow for two months while she spent time in the communion and the company of her companions. And at the end of two months... For reasons those of us who have never been that unsafe will never understand. She returned to her father, and he did according to her what he had vowed. In this disturbing story that invites our critique, in this tragic tale, may we find wisdom for our living.
Just before we dim the lights and watch uh, the trailer for this movie, I want to just tell you its, uh, its story. It's based on um, a memoir by Garrett Conley. It's his true story the on, as the only child of Arkansas parents, a devout Baptist family. His father is both a, a preacher and uh, operates a Ford dealership in a small community. This is a, a time in Garrett's life when he is about 18 years old. He goes off to college and returns home unexpectedly after experiencing a traumatic uh, experience in his um, college. In the course of that, he ends up disclosing to his parents, in his words, that he thinks about men. That causes his father to summon another pastor and another father whose son had made a similar disclosure to him many years before to come and give him counsel and he accepts their counsel that what their son needs to do is to engage a program to make himself heterosexual, to go into a behavioral correctional program. His mother takes him to Memphis and he participates in a two-week assessment program that is a day program. After witnessing the shaming and blaming and psychological and emotional abuse of that so-called therapy, he finds the courage to leave the program and his mother finds the courage to help him leave that program. For Garrett, he risks losing his faith and his family in order to keep himself from being erased. That is essentially the story of this film. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to see it. Here's a bit of that story as it comes in the official trailer for this movie. Karl Marx has been quoted as having said, religion is the opium of the people. In our current opioid crisis, we might hear that metaphor a little differently than he intended it. Knowing the terrors of addiction faced by so many might actually nuance that metaphor in our experience to dangers beyond comparing religion to a drug that functions to dull the human experience of suffering. Marx believed religion created an illusion that kept people from seeing reality as it really was and that religiously induced illusions stood in the way of the revolution needed to change the human condition. But as we've learned, opioids do more than numb pain. They hold other dangers. And perhaps we are having to come to terms with the fact that religion can be far more dangerous than numbing one to life's realities. It can be and it has been used as a deadly weapon. That quote from Karl Marx has been traveling with me this week. As I've thought about these two stories that we've heard this morning, the tragic tale of Jephthah and the harm he inflicted on his daughter and the painful and resilient story of Garrett Conley and his parents, told in his memoir and depicted in that film, Boy Erased. These are two terrible stories of religion weaponized, of undiscerning devotion, 
of parents harming their children in loyalty to their beliefs. They are difficult stories to hear, and they are important stories to tell. Jeff is not a relic of the past, but a stark warning of dangerous devotion, of religion gone wrong. Although he takes up several chapters in the sacred texts of both the Hebrew, of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, his is not a story we tend to hear in the synagogue or in the church. Children's Bible storybooks generally jump from the violence and the warriorhood of Joshua to Samson, and they give Jephthah a miss. Because what parent would want to tell this story as a bedtime story to their children? And Jephthah's story isn't fraught with moral ambiguity like the story of some parents who struggle about how to alleviate their children's pain or face their children's hunger or determine which of their children to pick up when you have to flee the horrors that have been perpetrated on your village. Jephthah's story has none of that moral ambiguity. It's a terrible tale of the perils of piety, of reckless and unreasonable religion, of a vow that creates a victim. But like the rest of us, Jephthah has a story and he is a story. He spent his life fighting for a place in his family, struggling to survive in a family that rejected him. And when war is on the horizon, he is sought out by the very clan that rejected him. And now that he can do something for them, he's worth something to them. So when he sees their need of him, he tenders his bargaining chip He'll fight for them if they'll make him their commander-in-chief. How often has that agenda been repeated? A wounded psyche is drawn like a magnet to achieve power and recognition. And when power isn't enough to fill the void within him, he reaches for piety and he makes a reckless and irresponsible vow because power and piety are always a deadly combination. So as the terrible tale goes, when he got religion, he made some grand gesture before his cohorts that when their God gave them victory in battle, he will celebrate the divine deliverance by sacrificing the first thing that comes through the door to greet him. What seduced him into making such a stupid promise? And what in the world made him keep such a senseless promise? Did he think it was going to make him a hero? Secure his place in the community and history as valiant and virtuous? What the hell was he thinking? How could his ego be more important to him than his daughter's life? How could he be blind to the consequences of his vow? He would have had to have known that some innocent bystander with no promise, no stake in that promise he was making, was going to pay the price for his egotistical boast. And who did he think it would be? And with classical cowardice, he blames the victim. Instead of accusing himself of insanity and losing face, he lashes out at his daughter as she sails across the threshold to welcome him home. And instead of throwing his arms around her and telling her how happy he is to see her, he rages at her and he accuses her of shaming him by being in the right place at the wrong time. He doesn't even pause for a moment before putting his devotion before his daughter. And she doesn't hesitate for a moment 
in putting her devotion to her father before her self-preservation, and there we have it. Everything that is necessary for devotion to move from dangerous to deadly. And this child that the story never names becomes in the world of the story the victim of her father's foolish vow. Sadly, this story doesn't give her an advocate. It doesn't give her an ally. It doesn't give her an adult to intercede. It doesn't give her anyone to stand up for her and protect her from the insanity of her father's religious terrorism. Garrett Conley had two parents who loved him and one who eventually could see that they were harming their son with their beliefs and that love required something more of her than blind obedience to her religious faith, to her family, to her marriage, to her church. Let's watch her as she comes to that turning point in this story. Garrett's mother's critical faculties and her courage to listen to her instincts, to act, to help her son end the manipulation and the humiliation and the indoctrination of a dangerous, and damaging treatment recommended by trusted religious leaders. Her, she helped to empower him to leave a program that is rooted in motivating behavioral corrections to make oneself acceptable to one's God, a program intent on shaping a sense of oneself as a broken being needing to recover, discover the cause of one's brokenness, searching one's family tree for rotten fruit, taking a moral inventory and exposing your supposed sins to the scrutiny and humiliation of those who would shame you and invite you to blame your supposed brokenness on your genetic inheritance. Garrett Conley survived being raped in college, survived seeking a path to get fixed at the behest of his religious inheritance, being tormented by the beliefs and the self-doubt he inherited, watch others be beaten and humiliating, trying to change themselves. But fortified by his mother's insight and solidarity, he began to find a way into being most truly, most fully, most happily himself. Several years after he left this program, he exposed this so-called treatment in his writing. It was published in the New York Times and in his memoir, and he has become an ally for LGBTQ2S people. He's married to his husband, living and writing in New York City. But Garrett's story doesn't just happen in Arkansas. 
nor in the 35 states where this so-called treatment is still legal, or in the seven provinces in Canada where it is still legal. But as Kevin Schultz, a beloved member of this community, will tell us, this story is painfully close to home. It's not easy to speak about these things. It's not easy to live through the torment of self-doubt and fears induced by religion, wielding rejection and damnation. Kevin and Garrett have bravely exposed and survived an experience that has to become extinct. We are indebted to you, Kevin, for speaking out for all of us. It's easy to turn away from the terror inflicted in the name of our own religious tradition and to see religious terrorism in other religious traditions. It's easy to see extremism. But no religious system is exempt. And any teaching that seeks to erase identity or divide human community into superior and inferior, into divinely accepted and divinely rejected, ought to raise our deepest suspicions and warrant our fiercest scrutiny. Because healthy religion does not ask us to fracture ourselves or to break one another. Healthy religion invites us to be more of who we are, not less. And healthy religion doesn't ask any of us to become martyrs to our parents' faith or our own faith, but helps us to become at peace in our own skin. The words that preceded that quote by Karl Marx are telling. The words that come before those we know so well are these. Religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of the heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. If religion loses its sigh and its stand and its shout for whoever and whatever is oppressed, if religion loses its heart for the well-being of the world and those forms of life, human and more than human, who share this world, if religion sells its soul, surrenders its search, and settles for precepts and doctrines, it's never very long before it sponsors terror. And so we must be vigilant with our voice, with our vote, with our vow. We must be vigilant in being a source of light and love. We must be vigilant to resist all that would turn beliefs into weapons, doctrines into cruel certainties, and fear into harming another for whatever purpose. We need each other. And we need the strength of who we are together and the courage to keep speaking our truth, to take the terror out of religion.
One of the reasons we gather as spiritual community with each other week by week is to strengthen our intentions to live faithfully, truly, with our highest values of love, truth, fairness, generosity, integrity. And so as an act of commitment to that end, we speak these words of prayer together as we seek to strengthen our intention to live in those ways. We embrace with gratitude the gift of life, the mystery of being, and the richness of diversity. In this time together, may we strengthen our intention to bring healing to hurt, peace to violence, beauty to ugliness, and love where there is fear and hatred. May we find the grace to accept ourselves, affirm each other, and work together for a more compassionate world. We pray as those born of love and endless light. May it be so. We go from this time with one another also making a vow, but not a deadly vow, a life-giving vow. Oh, good. Oh, good is right. <laughs> to be about light and love in all the places we live, in the circles of family and friends, of those who are strangers to us, in our workplaces, in our communities, in the places where life takes us. We go together in the strength of who we are with one another to bear light, and love. <laughs> 